in a way. It maybe has led to less um, comparative literature, wouldn't you say? And in campuses and in the university, it'd be like harder to get a job as a cop lit person. No, it was, it's always been hard. Yeah, it's always hard to get any job. Um, <laughs> but harder for a comp lit. Yeah, um, because there is so much available in, in English, not through translation, that is, um, you know, from former colonized areas. And so the post-colonial literature is well entrenched now, and there are jobs in post-colonial literature. Uh, is that what you're talking about? Like how did that, the well, Anglophone yeah, literature? Like, because I think they said, and I think we see that like a lot nowadays, there's so many like underrepresented cultures, like in history and now that created those mainstream movements to some extent and so like I wanted to look into some of that with British literature mm -hmm. and like because some ideas might have come from more of a minority group but it's formally from a mainstream group because that's who wrote about it and that was who published or who was published and mm -hmm. read um, so that's what I wanted to look into and that you sort of did that beyond British literature with the Irish writers and stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, there's also, um, again, one of your kind of justifications might be a gap. Mm -hmm. It could also be someone who's gone out of style, right? And who is, um, seems like it used to be important, uh, people used to think is important, and then for a long time they didn't for certain reasons, and maybe it's worth a second look. Um, Kylan, like, did that a mm -hmm. few years ago. This writer who was seen as really important and then really falls out of favor because because modernism. Um, and he made the case that, um, okay, this guy writes in purple 19th century high oratory, but we can still go back and, and, right, and see something interesting here. So that kind of recovery work has been done. Obviously, feminist criticism did a lot of that and is probably not finished. Um, so yeah, you might sort of poke around and look for has-beens who yeah. are worthy of... <laughs> Rehabilitation. Yeah, they just found uh, what was formerly believed to be a lost Frances Harper collection, her first collection of poems. So Frances Harper is a 19th century African-American woman writer. And nobody thought that forest leaves existed anymore. So this graduate student went to the Maryland Historical Society and typed into the catalog forest leaves or autumn leaves whatever and it popped up and she was like what no wait this doesn't exist nobody thought it existed but she found it and one of the interesting things about it was there was a poem in it about prisons about a felon so prison studies was important in the 1850s just like it is now and it's another one of the many social justice issues that Frances Harper cared about so that you know that's so, and this happened very recently, and I just found out about it because I had twins in the, in, in the interim. <laughs> but yeah, there are um, certainly things still being recovered and and rediscovered and reanimated. Kellen, do you want to ask a question next? Uh, sure. So I'm taking Kush's theory, literary criticism class right now, and we were trying to group you guys into what kind of theory or criticism we thought you reflected in your teaching, which was really kind of hard, <laughs> especially for the teachers I haven't had, but I was wondering what type of theory or criticism you usually use in your teachings, or usually go to. <laughs> <laughs> or do you even? Everybody's looking oh, at I nothing. definitely don't think like, oh, okay, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to pull a Lacanian psychoanalytic <laughs> uh, trick out of my, you know, out of my pocket today, and then that'll really set them up tomorrow for, for, for new historicism or something. Um, yeah, that hasn't been a, a, a conscious thing either. Like an, my undergrad, I never took a theory course. I knew I had heard about deconstruction. It was very confusing. <laughs> I wasn't exactly sure what it was, but. I know it, I, I had sort of absorbed a way to write a paper that would always show that the text was like contradictory and, and sort of fell apart. And I became kind of cynical because that's how you could get an A. You could, you could give me a text, I could fill it out and write a deconstructive argument. But it was basically um, new critical deconstruction, like not reading much in terms of secondary sources. Um, but I didn't really know that I had, you know, that this was, I was working within two sort of related theories until like I got to grad school and I was like, oh, there are others. Um, and Irish studies was maybe um, 
more like cultural studies before cultural studies sort of consolidated, just because I've always was interested in in history and 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 culture as well as the literature and their, their connections. So um, yeah, and I, I, we were just talking in drama too how we, that course is a little different from other courses, modern drama, in that it's still genre based. We used to have a lot of genre based courses and they've switched more to historical based courses. So that says something about the field in general that's more interested in historical context and awareness than just genre and sort of appreciation, right? So um, I think I've just, you know, followed in that, in that current, both because it is the current, but maybe particularly my field too, sort of encourages that more than some others. Is looking for ancient Chinese shoes a form of new historicism? I would think it is. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think you could make that argument yeah. that, that digging into the past yeah. and, and, and recovering it is a, is, a, is a kind of new historicism. Because if we're going to use new historicism to read literature, then it would make sense that authors kind of use something similar to make it. Yeah, yeah. And and I, I was I was trained as a new critic. I mean, you know, because I had went to Swanee, the home of the Swanee Review, which is the oldest literary quarterly in the country. So, you know, it was kind of old school. And, you know, what we would think of today is very old school. But the text was the most important thing. That was what you looked at first. Everything else came afterward. And, and I think in a way that sort of, as a, as a fiction writer, you know, then obviously the text is the most important thing. But you have to do a lot of research. I'm an applied linguist. Theory is kind of a bad word. Um, um, so, and and I'm also a linguist, and don't come at um, at literature from a sort of a critical perspective. If I come at literature at all, it's more as a how can I make sure that my non-native speaking students can understand this stuff. Um, so I, I kind of kind of divorce myself from the the, the discussions of, of literary theory criticism. Who wants to go next? Oh, the last one. Okay. Uh, what are the most important skills that y'all required as English students? Well, and that y'all so used today? Like just English skills that you pick up basically only in the English. Because I have a bad story, can I start? <laughs> <laughs> um, I was an English major solely because I couldn't figure out what in the world I wanted to do with my life. Um, and I kind of skated through English on reading clip notes and um, writing well. Um, and so I, 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 I think I'm a bad representation, but I'll be honest and, and say, yeah, I, I got a degree. I didn't really um, get a lot of, uh, uh, I think perhaps any degree would have um, prepared me for the kinds of thinking and communicating that I, that I would have needed to do. So you guys sell it better, please. Please save us, save the department. <laughs> I, when I learned it again, this goes back to, I guess what I just said. Sorry. Um, you know, just learn to pay close attention. Um, just learn to have my antenna up. Um, and that was, I mean, I grew up in a small town in Georgia. Um, I was lucky enough to have parents who, who who liked to read, and so I had a I had a lot of books around, and they didn't care what I read. They didn't censor my reading. Uh, they took me to the library, you know. So, so that was, you know, that was that was formative for me. Um, and, but I didn't really know how to read uh, until because you know, it's public school. So, you know, I didn't know how to read until I got to college. Uh, and then I had those good teachers that I talked about a while ago, who taught me how to pay really close attention to what was in front of me instead of just skimming off the surface of it. And that taught me to to read the world like that and to read people like that and not just you know let the surface of my brain skim off the surface of the world that I had to if I wanted if I wanted to live I had to get deeper than that and, and so you know in that sense um, you know, paying attention was, was something that I learned as an English major that, that I'm really glad I learned how to do yeah and a kind of patience that that requires that realizing I can if I breeze through this poem just being aware and okay with the fact that I've I've only kind of unfolded, you know, 14% of it, and that um, it's gonna, it's gonna, 
it's kind of a patience and a trust that closer examination is going to yield more information, more interesting facets, contradictions, ambiguities. Um, that sounds pretty new critic, right? But um, it does, right? So um, I was talking to a historian one time and he was talking about um, uh, a complicated field and that someone had brought great simplicity to it. And I was like, I think, is it only in English where someone says, when, when someone says, I'd like to complicate that, that's like a good thing. <laughs> in, in most yes. areas of life, that's sure. pain in the neck. Um, <laughs> but like, in an English discussion, you're like, oh, that's great, let's complicate it, let's screw it up, you know? Yeah. Let's show that it's like more messy and interesting and multifaceted than it seems to be on the surface. Despite the popular perception, applied linguistics does not try to do that. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> Oops. And that will fall over the... Um, that brings me to my next question. Um, I was a chemistry major for two years um, before I decided I wanted to be an English major. Um, and I kind of just went with what my parents wanted me to do and what, what I was good at. But I had a love for English pretty much my whole career in school. So, um, and it being in each one of you guys' classes, I had a lot of beneficial takeaways from each one of you guys. Um, so what was the most beneficial um, takeaway from college and after college and even now from being an English major? What did you learn that that helped you the most in school that got you to this point right now? Similar to the last answer, I guess, right? Um, yeah, I mean, part you could kind of give the sort of Marx's answer that it's about um, the starting things and finishing them and showing up on time and showing that you're modeling that you're going to be a good worker, <laughs> that you meet deadlines and that you follow through on things. There's also the more complicated Marxist kind of Habermas answer that if our society is this black box and we're constantly um, inundated with images and text and everything in terms of our use of phones and the internet and media, then learning how to look carefully and closely and think about what's being pushed upon us might grant us more freedom not to be controlled by the black box. Have you heard of the black box theory? It's just the idea that we don't think because you know, Google controls us. Right. It controls sort of like what Dr. McConnell was just saying, like how close reading helps him sort of close read everything else in life. And it just teaches you to be alert. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And awake. Yeah. Alive to the possibilities of what things that are. Yeah. On that thought of Google controlling us, <laughs> um, how do you guys use technology in your in your classrooms? Is there a way you've developed it as technology has developed? Have you gone along with it? Have you stepped back from technology and preferred more of the actual book looking in it? Or have you like how have you used technology? 